Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the TUX Distinguished Lecture Series. I'm Anne Sjörny, Professor of Information Systems at Åbo Academy University, and it's my great pleasure to introduce to you today's uh, guest lecturer, Professor Kalle Lutinen. Kalle Lutinen is um, the uh, most accomplished Finnish-born information systems researcher. His list of merits is far too long to go into in depth. But to give you some sort of idea who he is, I can tell you that he has published more than 150 journal articles. His age index is whopping 74. Uh, and he is well known for his breadth of research interest. But today he is with us in his role as the uh, distinguished university professor, chair of Iris S. Wolfstein and um, chair of the Department of Design and Innovation at the University, uh, at the Case Reserve University uh, in the United States. And um, he is going to tell us about modern innovation management in the digital world. Please welcome Professor Kalle Lutinen. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Just, uh, I don't know whether the loudspeakers are working, so can you hear at the back? Well, good. I also realized that uh, I couldn't make this di digital technology work, so I'll have to remain standing here beside and change the slides. First of all, um, uh, I'm very uh, pleased that I can be here and also see some of my old friends and maybe some new friends. Um, I have uh, some sort of a close uh, affinity, also affectionately to the uh, universities in Turku, because my first uh, professor position, which I ever held, actually was here at Turku in '86 one spring, and I came here for a few nights, stayed at actually Marco Nurminen's house and taught a course on systems design. Uh, and that was the sort of first launch for my career as a professor. And I, at that time, uh, I made a lot of uh, friends. Uh, the topic which I'm talking uh, is not that, I would rather say that it's not a paper presentation. It's rather a description of an ongoing uh, chains and uh, uh, trying to understand something which is, uh, has been going for a while while we are inside it and trying to understand what's actually going on. And uh, one aspect of that is the uh, actually uh, what it culminates is actually the building where I work which is here, which is Peter B. Lewis building. It was the first building and it's designed by Frank Gehry first of all. It looks very Frank Gehry building. Uh, but it was the first building in the USA which was totally, uh, totally designed and constructed using digital technologies. There were no paper prints at all at the construction site. Everything which they did was based on looking at computer screens. And all the measures were actually drawn from the uh, digital models, three-dimensional digital models. And that was a way to build this uh, extremely complicated geometries, which you can see here also, and here this is smaller, this is from inside. Uh, so uh, it's an indication that the digitalization is influencing all walks of life, and the innovation which we see in different fields of social and organizational life are somehow always associated with the possibilities and changes of, of digital technologies. And this has also resulted in the change of the terms, because this phenomenon is changing. As a result of that, we have been all the time trying to capture its meaning, so the terminology is changing. I remember when we started this field we, in Finland, in Finnish it was called ATK, Automated and Theater, and in Swedish uh, something like data behandling, uh, and in US uh, English it was EDP, electronic data processing. Uh, those days are gone, then we could call them ICT or information technologies, and now everybody is talking about digitalization. Even in Finnish I've heard, noticed that word. Why are we changing uh, the terms when the underlying uh, actually technology is exactly the same? Uh, and uh, what are the effects which uh, generates this? I, I was on sabbatical uh, about 10 years ago here in Finland, and I gave a course on digital innovation. I, and at that time when I put the course, and it was of course indexed in Google, that was the only 
That was the first thing which came up when I uh, searched in Google at that time. So uh, about 10 years ago, 2008, it was uh, un largely unknown. It was not used. So in 10 years, something significant has happened. At the same time, if you look at, this is just a, a quite reason to Google search about what Google search gives if you hit the digital innovation. And you can see that uh, I've been lucky or whatever. Uh, most of these are written by uh, either me or uh, my colleagues, uh, Yun Jing Yu and uh, Ula Hendrickson, which I've collaborated on this topic. But it's also now expanding and it's becoming much more commonly wide used. For example, the second one is by well known people, in which, which I don't have any connection, otherwise, I know very well Rob Fishman. Um, but it's about the uh, curricula around digital innovation. So, uh, so it shows that uh, something has happened or uh, has been happening over the last 10 years. And what is it? And how is it actually, um, how should we uh, un understand it? And what are the reasons why we are changing the terms? And what are the reasons why we have to start uh, thinking much more deeply about it? Of course, the idea itself is relatively simple. And that has been known actually at least 50 or 60 years, which is the idea of bit or digits. Uh, so that you can actually encapsulate any type of information, any type of pres presentation into just these uh, two uh, states and their combinations, zeros and ones, in, on an abstract le level. And this, of course, underlies the idea of what people call the, uh, the digital engine. That uh, everything which you do is basically represented with uh, zeros and ones. Uh, this is an abstraction. Uh, it has nothing to do necessarily with uh, how you do, with what sort of materialization it has. It's basically the idea of the abstraction that information can be abstracted into the, these types of uh, uh, zeros and ones which can be represented uh, in certain uh, types of physical states. And of course the next thing which came out of that is that uh, you can also represent behaviors in digitally. So that the behaviors themselves can be represented as information in zeros and ones. Which, uh, which uh, can be uh, stored in, in memory as a substitutable instruction. Of course this is the idea of von Neumann architecture. So these two ideas together have resulted in a very uh, different idea of how the, what the technology actually can do. The first one is that it's not mat material, it's just a bit string. It, uh, it's an abstraction. The second one is that, uh, and what it does, it, it basically uh, separates form and function. So the same function or the same content can be represented exactly with the similar types of uh, forms. And, you, and these can be loosely coupled. They are not anymore the same as you have in our world. The second outcome of this is digital convergence, which is the Shannon's idea that everything, all information, all content can be encoded in zeros and ones. Uh, and these two uh, uh, underlying ideas, of course, they have been around for a relatively long time because they are embodied in the promise of digitizing. But the reason why we are changing the terms is largely to the fact that the effects of these possibilities of, of using anything in this way has expanded enormously over the last 15, 20 years. And I'm going to get into that. There are certain uh, really key features which people have started to theorize and actually take, take conceptually much more seriously over the uh, maybe last 10 years. Uh, there have been a string, a string of articles written by uh, not all, but mostly by uh, IS scholars. Some are legal scholars like Lessig and so forth, which have tried to understand the specific nature of the uh, digital technology and the, and the specific aspects which it enables, which makes it different from other types of technologies. And these are some of the things which people have pointed out. The first one comes from the uh, von Neumann architecture, which is the uh, programmability. You can basically add new functions into the technology itself just by reprogramming it. So you separate the form and the function. The second one is convergence, because everything, all information can be represented in zeros and ones. You can actually, con uh, uh, you can actually con uh, connect any information with any other type of information. That results in the idea of convergence, which has been driving, for example, uh, areas like uh, telecommunications and uh, media industry and so forth. Uh, the third one, uh, which follows from the two first ones, is that you can edit anything in any way. And, and it enables uh, relatively easy ways of adding new types of functions and new types of contents. Uh, and you can also uh, uh, build them over time with relatively low cost. And the last one is reflexivity. 
which is that because the, uh, the, the representation is an ab abstraction already of zeros and ones, these zeros and ones can refer to other types of zeros and ones at infinity. So it basically enables that information can be represented with other types of information which can be represented with other types of information. And that enables uh, uh, enormous flexibility in the ways in which these technologies can be used. The common way where you can see, for example, that is the idea of XML. That the, the representation of the content of the information comes with the information itself. It's a reflexive already. So these are the sort of uh, key features which you don't find uh, in other types of technologies. And the question is to what extent these, tech, these features make it different. And under what conditions it might make the, uh, these uh, the, uh, effects different. And of course the next aspect of that has been that the material basis based on which these types of digital uh, uh, representations can be represented and stored and processed has, has, been, has undergone enormous advances over the last uh, 30 to 40 years. Of course it started with uh, people like Turing uh, uh, or, or the UNIVAC and others, these are from 40s and 50s where the, the, the first physical realizations of the ways in which the digital is materialized and actually run on some sort of material were uh, implemented. But since then the sort of um, material engine, the computer, has gone uh, significant uh, advances. And it's a, uh, actually any more, not even possible to talk about it as a single computer. It's basically a, um, what I would call more, rather an infrastructure of computing. And of course what we have seen is the uh, radical transformation in the speed and the cost of processing these types of representations with the, these capabilities which I pointed out, the programmability, editability, convergence and so forth. And, and we know this story and, and you probably have seen these, uh, these, uh, these graphs, these are all logarithmic uh, exponential graphs, not linear graphs. So you may get the wrong sense of what, what's actually going on when you look at these linear graphs, like the, the cost of the the cost performance ratio of computing power itself, which is of course known <coughs> as Moore's law. You can see that it was relatively fast until about 2010 and it, it, now it has slowed down. And the, the challenges are largely physical because we are in the, at the physical edge of to what extent we can really back into the silicon anymore. We have all types of power problems and leakage problems and so forth. But uh, overall this, this uh, growth curve has been enormous. And what, what has it enabled? Uh, here's one example of that, is that if you look at the how, mu how much we need computing power to do certain types of things which we think are uh, represent intelligence or capabilities, such manipulating textual information to things like uh, computer-based vision, the amount of speed and, uh, or processing power that you need to do that has been going up. Yeah. Uh, uh, requires much more uh, capabilities and these are the points at which certain types of things could in principle be done. Now 2002 is about 15 years ago and after that we have had enormous increase in the speed uh, of computers what we have. So as a result we have things like Alexa or, or Echo it from, uh, from uh, Amazon or similar type of Google uh, Home where you can actually do speech recognition and natural language understanding just by plugging a small thing on your table and talk to that. All this is founded on the fact that we, we just have the computing power to do it now. Uh, uh, similarly, we can see about the uh, uh, cost of storage. Uh, we, we can see this is another way, but simi similar uh, cost line but uh, in exponential, uh, uh, ex exponential decline in the cost per uh, uh, gigabyte. And currently we are, uh, the cost is uh, com coming close to one cent per gigabyte. Um, I remember when we, uh, around the time when I was here an associate professor and we bought a uh, unit at that time of fancy VAX at the University of Uvascula and, it, and we felt that it had an enormous uh, storage space and it was about 500 megabytes. That was the largest uh, disk you could find at that time and it cost something like 200,000 or 300,000 Finnish marks at the time. So it just uh, shows the sort of the change in the, uh, in the capabilities of that. And of course the same can be uh, shown in terms of e transmission. 
and this is what, what people know the Kilder's law is the that the, also the, the, the cost ratio of transmission over a bit, bit over a certain period of time that, that cost has also been increasing in exponential rate. Uh, and these are the actual measures, uh, so, so bits per, uh, per second speed which we can currently obtain. Of course much of that goes to things like uh, fiber optics and new types of uh, ways of using wavelengths and so forth and new ways of also using um, uh, wireless technologies. And the final uh, capability which is important for this new environment is of course connectivity. There are different ways of measuring that. One relatively simple way which shows also the exponential growth is uh, the number of internet domains or the number of connected, uh, connected uh, uh, addresses uh, on internet which has also been growing on the, inter, uh, in the, on the uh, exponential scale, which uh, enables this type of information to be basically connected to any other node in any place or any time. So these are the sort of foundations. We have this digital capability, we have the processing power, we have the transmission power, we have the storage power. So what has happened with this? Since this is just the technological part, the technological theory of digitizing. Of course, the first what happened was that we, uh, people already in the 60s and 70s started to digitize work in different forms, different aspects of the work process which are important uh, and, and rely on different types of representations. And we have seen that going ongoing for the last 40 to 50 years, starting from simple things like payroll processing to relatively complicated uh, tasks which people now do, like uh, designing chips, for example. We did a, uh, recently a a case study on um, how people currently design uh, computer chips and, uh, the, and it, it has actually transformed enormously over the last five to six years because now people uh, instead of wiring things they basically let the computer to do the wiring and they can and the task within, uh, or the scale in which they can now wire these uh, chips is that you, you basically integrate like two million chips two million gates or two million uh, functions, boolean functions in one run. And that, that may take a lot of time, but uh, it's, uh, it's a totally different way of designing chips than in the past. So we have seen both uh, efficiency uh, changes, but we have also seen changes in the, uh, in the actual work content. The work has changed as a result of that. Uh, another uh, outcome of that is, of course, digitizing the tools and the outcomes. The, the, I put here also Frank Gehry's uh, building. This is actually from the uh, Empirical uh, Music Project. If you go to Seattle, you can find this building. It was paid by Paul Allen. It, 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 has, also the, it has also the nickname when we went to Frank Gehry's office. They said that this is spam. Spend Paul Allen's money. Because they used so much money to sort of build this up. But again, this is also... Uh, uh, an example of a digitizing because tools digitizing three-dimensional uh, structures, which they did uh, enable to actually uh, generate totally new outcomes. And, not, uh, and they used totally different tools in actually both designing and constructing uh, buildings as a result of that. It's more than just uh, digitizing work, it's also the outcomes, the outcomes change. Of course, we have been, uh, since light, late 90s, or early 90s, learned how to digitize uh, time and space which is now common practice in all representations like Google Maps and so forth. And which are changing the way in which people think about time and space and experience time and space. Uh, we have also seen uh, outcomes of digitizing relationships. <laughs> For better or worse, I don't always know that. that. But, uh, uh, for example, uh, examples of that of course are Facebook and multiple other forms which are generating totally new sphere of social activity and social connectivity which we didn't have before. And of course uh, now people talk about the Internet of Things, so we are also seeing now digitizing the physical environment. Which means that uh, all types of uh, uh, physical things become connected into this enormous network of all types of other information which we have already available. And as a result we are seeing uh, changes in that like uh, Products like tables may be uh, at the same time uh, artifacts for representing information and they may be provide interactivity which we didn't have before. Um, we may also have new types of ways of thinking about um, uh, existing products. Uh, this is an MIT's, uh, uh, have you, has anybody seen this picture before? Although it's quite old but it's an interesting uh, piece of uh, technological history. 
Uh, this is uh, MIT's uh, car of the future, which they finished about 2008-2009. It's totally uh, it's built on uh, stack architecture, like in internet-based stack architecture. The engines are in the wheels, and it's totally modular structure. So you can take the wheels out and put additional wheels, and everything runs on field. It, it's actually thought as a car as a service. So it provides some mapping services uh, and other types of things. They, at that time, they didn't have the idea of driverless cars, but uh, that would, would be just an additional service layer on this. Um, and you can see uh, similar ideas also having effect on uh, industries. The reason why Tesla, Tesla's value is higher than General Motors or Ford's, Although uh, Ford manufactures about 5 million cars and uh, General Motors about 6 million cars and uh, uh, Tesla, as far as I understand, currently manufactures about 500,000 cars. So why is the value of that car, of Tesla, so much higher? It, it's largely due to the fact that they have figured out how to build a, a car which is basically software driven, not hardware driven. And the whole architecture is basically prepared upon the idea that software is more important than, than hardware. Uh, the uh, actual manufacturing capability and skills. Uh, whether that's bad, which the Wall Street is doing, is going to realize is another story, but it just shows that how the value, what are seen, seen as the, the sources of value are changing rapidly as a result of this uh, digitalization effort. Um, <clears throat> So, what we have seen uh, with all these examples is the fact that uh, we have seen exponential growth in the, in the technical capabilities of, of digitizing any type of content with these properties. This growth uh, as by itself, uh, the growth rates have also uh, followed exponential rates. So the, the speed at which the, the change happens has been increasing all the time, all the time. Uh, which makes it much more harder to understand actually what is actually happening and how it's happening. And uh, that, uh, as a result of that, we have also seen these enormous uh, uh, cumulative investments in digital engine and its capabilities, which are now offer the potential to change or think most of the uh, aspects of designing products or services very differently. Uh, and it's also changing the views of digital engine and its use and capability. And that's why we are also seeing this uh, uh, change that we, are, we have to invent all the time new terms. Because the older terms didn't, don't really capture what we are trying to characterize as a phenomenon, because the phenomenon is changing so fast. And that's where we are. Uh, many of the people, of course, have now tried to discuss what are those unique ca characteristics, what these technologies, uh, digital technologies currently offer. And uh, this is just one uh, list which we have been uh, offered. Uh, that what, what makes it different? The first one is uh, co uh, convergence, which means that different types of stuff can be now put together. And much of the innovation happens at the, at the marginal ends, where the diverse things are put together. For example, um, if you think of driverless cars, they, of course, you need to have the car, but that's not an interesting. But you have to put together uh, new types of radar, te radar technologies, which is the battle between the Uber and the Google now, largely, that who owns the IP on that. But you have to also uh, have uh, infrastructure of the mapping capabilities. You have to have all types of AI algorithms to figure out and, and read this environment. So heterogeneous different types of capabilities have to be put together. And you have to have also hardware and other capabilities to actually think of the, how you actually run that stuff. Uh, you can also see in all of this that, that you have to, uh, you have much higher level of heterogeneity. Different types of stuff can be put together and need to be put together when you innovate. And that creates all types of challenges in the way in which innovation actually happens and what enables that inno innovation. So in a way, as, as uh, innovation scholars talk about it, they say that you ha have to nowadays much more cut across multiple social and technical worlds which were ne uh, before separate. Because people in the car industry never talked before with people doing radars, for example. In, only in occasional cases. Now it's a required thing to do in order to uh, move forward. The third one is that uh, because of the nature of the digital technology itself and the, uh, and the assets which you have, they enable, given the two first ones, what people call generativity. 
and that's a Citrange term which says that, that multiple different types of uh, actors or users or audiences come actually come and actually build new stuff on top of what you have already. And you cannot control that. They will just do it. Uh, of course, one example of that is, for example, Waze, which is now owned by Google. But originally, just some people started to use the existing maps, which the Google did, to provide a uh, driver, uh, driver's guiding service, which started to compete with uh, Google, Google Maps and some other things. Uh, uh, people can just do this stuff, uh, and you don't know where they, they actually come from, necessarily, because they have these uh, capabilities. And the uh, current assets enable new expansive forms of building these types of capabilities. And the last one is, as a result of all these things, the, the, the speed at which things happen is much faster. And, it, and uh, understanding that the, the space is much, it's much harder to understand what is actually ha happening because of the fast pace of these things happening so fast. So, you, uh, so <clears throat> this has had... Uh, uh, enormous uh, significance for uh, people who are inter interested in general also about innovation, which I broadly define here as if you come up with the two, type, well, the two aspects to that. The first that you come to something which nobody has come before and which may have some value that's typically regarded as a innovation of a first kind. Or secondly, you, you uh, innovate in the say that you absorb that thing and use it yourself, which is the diffusion of innovation. But these are typically uh, related to somehow, but the uh, innovation typically captures both of them. Now, digital innovation in this context largely means that you, uh, that you, that you are using these technologies uh, by creating and resulting changes in the market offerings, business processes, models that result from the use of these types of technologies. That's a very broad definition, but it captures most of the things which people have done. Uh, and what we have seen also is the difference between digitizing and digitalization. We made a, this type of uh, differentiation in my article, which I wrote with uh, David Tilson and Karen Stern in 2010. Digitizing is just the actual process of technically making some stuff digital. And digitalization is the, the way in which you embed that socially into certain contexts so that it provides value for in that social setting or context. These are, uh, uh, the second one is much broader because it, may, it requires changes in the business, it may cause changes for the business models, changes in the regulation, changes in the, uh, the way in which certain things are done and so forth. One example of that might be um, high fre frequency trading which is now very important aspect, but people really don't write. There, there's some people who write about it, but I, uh, just a question. How, how much do you think that uh, currently are, if you look at all the stock, stock trade or equity trades in the US uh, stock markets, how, how large a pro proportion of that is uh, currently traded by computers? 98%. Oh, well, I, it's not that high yet. What? Well, of course, all of them are at, at, at some level 100% uh, 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 digital. At one point, they will be there's a digital intervention in the actual trade action. So, computer makes a decision: I'm going to buy this stock, I'm going to sell that stock. That's what people call high frequency trading. And the reason why you do it is that computers can do it so much, so much faster than humans. Humans typically require at least two seconds to do something. In, in, com uh, in co computer can do it in a few microseconds, which is a million times difference. So, do, uh, so me, I'm asking in this context that how large proportion of all the stocks in the U.S. stock markets are currently carried out by just algorithms trading with other algorithms? That's what, what is happening. That's what I mean. There's no human intervention at that level. It's about 35 percent, which is scaring high. But that's a sort of uh, uh, example that, uh, that this has happened only in the last 10 years. And uh, the environment in which, which has been built to regulate and understand the trading is actually not in line with the actual capabilities which these systems have. And we have seen as a result things like the flash crash in 2013 and so forth, where the markets dropped 20% in five seconds because algorithms operated in unexpected ways. 
and of course, these types of threats are different between. A, there has been a digitizing, but the digitalization, the social technical environment, hasn't been set up <laughs> such that uh, certain things uh, cannot be avoided. Now, uh, I'm going to go through a couple of cases uh, I've been writing with some of my colleagues. These are from Speed, uh, most of, both of them are from Speed. A couple of cases how we can see over time these types of effects uh, in, in certain industries. And the first one is a case, is, is a well known Swedish newspaper. It, it still actually exists, very similar to Turun Sanovat here or something like that. It's not uh, from uh, Stockholm area, but it's a very well known and well established uh, newspaper. Uh, it started in 1905, it was established, and 2015 they actually uh, basically gave up and said we are not anymore a newspaper company, we are basically a media or content company. It, you may say that, well, that, what's a big deal? It's a big deal for if you are uh, been running 100 years uh, as a journalist. High, striving for high quality journalism. That's what was their motto. And this is the quote from the CEO. That uh, historically there was a strong relationship between journalism and printed newspapers. Therefore we can hardly imagine one without the other. But perhaps today we have to question this view. Although the printed newspaper might eventually transform into something else, local journalism will continue to exist. Well, he thinks that there's some hope for this. But we don't know what it will look like, where the arena will be located, and what the toolbox will contain. Basically, he said everything is up for the crabs. We don't know. We cannot run it anymore as a, as a newspaper company. So how did this happen? It happened about in, in, in about 30 years. And all these effects can be attributed to the fact that digitization, digitalization changed everything in that environment. And the, the way which we sort of approach this, this is a lot of uh, pretty nervous uh, slides, so I'm not going to go through it. I'm just showing that we did all the uh, homework to do it. Basically, we can say that there are three effects which digitalization can have in organizations. The first one is structure. That's a classical socio-technical idea. That the technology has to be aligned with the task and it has to be aligned with the organizational structure. If you don't have that alignment, the technology will not support the task and it, 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 it will neither support the way in which the task can be carried out effectively. So we can say that you, the, and the structure typically handles internal processes or product lines or architectures. Product lines and architectures determine who does what in certain components. For example, when you put together a car, there's a separate group of folks which works on power transmission, engine, the body, chassis, and so forth. So that's one part, and that's well known that that level of digitization has been going on for uh, since the 60s, when the first computers were used. The next one is cognition, which means that, well, how does the organization think about itself and the environment? What categories, what, what constructs do they use to make sense of their environment? Does it have to change or does, will it remain the same? If you look at these examples, uh, for example, the example from the car, the, it's a major cognitive change to say that I'm not anymore producing a car, I'm producing a service. Very big, dif big difference. Because you have to think everything in very different terms. What does it mean to provide a service? So if you move from a product company to a service company, you have to change the, the large, large uh, pieces of your structure too. And the whole organization has to be aligned very differently. And the last one is identity, which means largely that who we are and how do we think that our relationships are established towards the other important stakeholders. Uh, you may say, ask that why these uh, latter ones are there. The reason why they are there is that when we did the analysis of the actual effects of digitalization in this newspaper, we found out that, that over time uh, these became much more pronounced and important. You know, as a conditions or uh, con uh, conditions to even think about digitization. And here's the here's the map. What we did. Uh, we, we mapped from 1981 to around 2010, just before this CEO made this statement. We mapped all the innovations which the organization did, or how they talked about it, doing content analysis of interviews of different people at different times, all the archival material and things, and looking at all the technologies which they introduced. And then we looked at, with regard to that technology, that what types of things did they actually try to accomplish with that? And you can see that. Uh, in the first, most of them focused on uh, this first dashed line is between the, pro, uh, the, the sort of internal process of the products. So you can see that uh, so, so you, uh, 
these are the technologies in the top which you introduced. The next one is the process innovation, so internal changes which they did. The next one is product innovation. Did they introduce new types of things which they offered to outsiders? The next one is that did they start thinking, talking differently about what they were doing? And the last one is the identity. I can see that uh, until about 1995, all effects of digitizing or the, uh, and the related digitization relate to the process, uh, internal processes. Then when internet emerged, they st started to innovate on products. It makes sense, because they, had to st they could now offer the content to the outsiders in a different format and package them in different ways. The content was separated from the media, which was the newspaper. That was what in, uh, internet enabled. And they had to sort of innovate around that, in, and uh, then when social media came, new types of innovations emerged. We can also say that the cognition changed first in around the same time, when they had to start looking at outside how they use the technology, uh, and frame internet as something which is important to understand as a means of uh, providing and distributing content in a different way. And then they had to, uh, and it led to the destabilizing the meanings and the status what the content actually is. What is the news? They have to start to even question that. And where does it come from? That was the next one which was questioned when they got the social media because it didn't anymore come from the news, their own journalists, it also came from the readers. And they had started to build up blogs and other things. And then, uh, all, when all this happens, the, all these, especially these types of changes happened in the CEO at one point said, well, we are not anymore a newspaper, we are something else. We have to think very carefully about what type of company we want to be. We are not going to be a newspaper anymore. Right. So this is just a story which shows that when the digitalization on goal goes over time, it hits deeper and deeper into the organization. And we could actually model it. Um, Yes. The previous slide. Yes. A lot of curiosity. Seeing that in identity, the see of one question holds competence, and then one year later, see of two. So it's a new see of two. Yes, they, they changed it. But that's very common. Yeah. This is very common at the time when our companies go into the crisis mode, but that they don't know anymore who they are. Yeah, but I mean, the point is that CEO one question in the board yes. is not a good idea for the CEO one. Yes, well, that's what actually happened in this case. It's not, you can look at a lot of what they call turnaround companies, yeah. that a lot of times there's a very fast turnaround. Because everybody comes with their vision, they cannot execute it, and the next one is bought in with the hope that he will or she will deliver it better. From this, how, how much, how fast is he? Around well, it has been also going up. It's like business school deans. The average life expectancy for a business school dean, I've heard, is two and a half years now. <laughs> yes. Which also shows that uh, actually business schools are in deep trouble in the US. I think it's an indication of that. And it's also, there are multiple aspects. One of them is globalization, but one aspect is also actually digital, digitalization of the content and the delivery me mechanisms. But the, uh, another way you can look at it is that there were like these big three waves of technologies. The first one was largely internal, which was they, they changed the, the production system within the organization from analog to digital, which was like editing news and other things, and distributing that in the newsrooms and how that went to the uh, actual newspaper. The next one was when the internet came, they could actually now distribute it differently. It wasn't anymore that uh, they had the digital content now already there because the news were producing digital forms. Now they could actually distribute in multiple different forms. And they had to start thinking about how they do it. And the third one was that they also realized that, well, it's not only the content which we produce, but we have to, there's also other content which we can actually uh, leverage upon or acquire and uh, distribute. So they moved from production to which I would call more like a brokering model which is happening with the multiple different types of newspapers nowadays. So they, in a way, try to compete with all other businesses, try to do, build a platform. And if you look at the, uh, the types of functions which they do, so innovations move from process to product to system, which is the ecology, uh, the scope. And you can see that the, the functions which they focus, the first one is largely that you, how easily you can edit the, the, the news and make it easier and more efficient and store. Then they move to reprogrammability. So you have this content somewhere lying. Can I reprogram 
the functions so that I can distribute the multiple channels in different ways, packets in different ways. And now it's generativity. Can I build a system that generates new interesting news from, a, from the environment? And similarly, you can see that it, uh, they move from these uh, different fu functions. Uh, we have actually looked at this as, a, as a, like a generative dance between um, that the, it starts with the structure. So innovation changes the structure or the structure has to be reframed by cognition, which calls for new ways of interpreting how the technology can be used in this new type of reframed structure. And at some point it may call also a reorientation of the identity. So it is this type of generative dance between these different layers of organizational performance. I'm going to come back to this at the end of the talk. Now I'm going to provide you another uh, very different level of analysis. This is actually from another new Swedish newspaper, um, uh, actually media company. This is a large media company which also owns a lot of assets in, in Finland. It's easy to figure out actually which, it was, which this is. It's not Yle, it's something else. Uh, but they introduced uh, around 2010 as, as the first company in the world a tablet uh, application for I iPad in which you could actually read uh, magazines. Uh, so they said that we are not going to only distribute magazines as a tabloid form, in the physical form. You can also uh, order them and read them on an on on iPad. And uh, I didn't put it here but when the, um, um, uh, Steve Jobs introduced iPad. Uh, they, had, they gave it to a number of companies beforehand to build some apps on that. And the, the, the most highly lauded uh, application uh, by Steve Jobs was this application in the, in the actual product uh, announcement of the iPad. Uh, he, he called it like the king of the hill or something like that in his, in his talk. Now the, the thing what they had was basically that you have to think that how do you actually introduce a newspaper reading experience, a magazine newspaper experience on a, on a, on a tabloid, on the tablet. That was the sort of question, how do you do that? And if you think that what, if you do want to design that, there, uh, the, these are traditional layers of design what you have to do. So you, the first one is of course if you are doing newspapers you have to do graphic design. So how it looks, the, the fonts and other things. Uh, which are typography, illustration, photography, audio, all the, uh, these are the old things which you have typography, illustration, but in, now in, in digital form you can also add audio and video because these are easy, easy to integrate. There. So you have additional aspects in the, the graphic part. Industrial, that's the, the experience of moving physically things around, the, the, how the product looks. Here you are actually largely uh, constrained because the iPad is the iPad. It may be different sizes, but you have uh, screen size, input devices, hardware, all this influence the way which you would think about it. Which is very different from the close one, which was largely about paper quality, paper size, what type of glossy paper you use, and so forth. Then there's the interaction uh, aspect. In this, this form largely says that you flip and unfold and you may have table of contents. That's pretty much the in interaction, how you define, how you read the magazines. Here you have, may have very different navigation structures, which you have to consider. No, uh, do you follow exactly the same as physical world or do you do something different? And the last one is the environmental, which is largely the uh, how you distribute this content, uh, uh, storage and distribution and how you pay for it business model, the business logic. And all this you have to actually, the design had to go across the whole stack when they did it. It's not just the application, you have to actually touch the whole stack. Um, and, and what we did is that actually we interviewed people and we traced uh, uh, trace all the events, what happened, how this uh, design process underwent over the about 18 month period when they started to do it until they finished it. And it shows that they, they basically moved between this top, top one is graphic, industrial, interaction, environmental, and some contextual events. You can see that it's basically a, like two cycles where you go through the whole stack. If you think that you are a newspaper magazine and you have been doing just newspapers and you introduce a news, new newspaper, you would only do these two first ones, nothing else. Only the, only the uh, graphic and industrial design. You might do something science and things like that. Nothing else, because that was the where your skills typically are if you are in graphics industry. 
The rest is given. It's assumed to be exactly the same. It has been done for 100 years in a similar manner. Now, in this case, uh, this shows the heterogeneity. They have to actually start thinking all these things at the same time. And, and in order to get it done, they have to also circulate fines in order to get it in a certain sense that it works. By the way, later on when they moved to this, they also built another business, which is selling the software and also the platform for other newspapers to uh, actually provide similar type of content. So it's a generic uh, uh, solution to how you actually read and distribute and acquire content for magazines. So it shows that uh, the idea also the pace, it had to be done very fast and a heterogeneity, which I pointed out. So it's no wonder that, um, and this is from some of the top people in uh, innovation literature, uh, Michael Tushman from Harvard uh, and Brenner, who is currently soon, uh, Brenner, she's at the University of Minnesota. They recently wrote an article in um, Academic Management Review. Uh, it's a, like a 10 years anniversary article about a very important article on innovation literature. It was published in 2005 on exploration and exploitation logics. And they basically wrote that what we did at 2005 anymore doesn't, it doesn't matter anymore. The key point is that the nature of innovation and organization growth may be at the transition point because of digital revolution. It's interesting to see these are the top strategy or innovation scholars which you can probably find in American universities. They are now realizing that something is happening. Which is different. Our old theories may not work. Now, the articles which I uh, distributed have tried to understand what are the differences which are making this a very challenging field. The first one is that the boundaries, what is and what is not an innovation outcome, have become more porous and fluid. You can see this from uh, these two cases. In the first one, you could see, uh, see that, well, innovation may cut down to the identity that didn't have it. If you were a car company, you were a car company. But now it, it's not anymore clear that you're a car company, you're a software company. It's a very different identity. Uh, similar innovation processes have become less bounded in terms of their location, temporal structure, and participation forms. If you look at the uh, latter design of the uh, uh, iPod, uh, uh, this iPad, you could see that it, it moved from one location to another. Very different settings, from business models to, uh, to uh, graphical design, to software design, to something else. And these were actually globally distributed in this process. Some of the people worked at Silicon Valley, some in London, some in Sweden during that 18 month period. So it's a, it's a very different type of uh, uh, process than it used to be. So this idea which we used to have in the past, that you have fixed products and services, you have the famous value chain, and then you have here uh, certain ways in which you configure certain parts of the value chain or certain aspects of the value chain, probably doesn't work anymore. It's much more complicated than that. The sort of topics which you see in these models, like um, environment, it's, these are assumed to be fixed, they're outside here. But now these are part of the design. Similarly, the identity is not here. The identity is exactly, and we, are a, we are a company which produces services or something, and we will focus this on, on margins. This may not work anymore. So, uh, and with that goes many classical ideas which people have taught in organization theory and strategy. For example, that you have hierarchical organization, you have control over it. You have network modules, and uh, which enables coordination between things. You, you, you use physical, you probably use physical artifacts to produce physical things, and you use the technologies to co support that. And you automate things, you may outsource, and you may globally distribute physical things. But that has been largely the idea until probably about 2005, 2010. This doesn't work anymore. So, so the axioms which people have had in this context about innovation, which are that bounded and fixed innovations within uh, given boundaries of organization in this value chain don't work anymore. The innovation agency is centralized, so the, the firm innovates, or it places, gives it to somebody to innovate. This is changing, because the technologies and the capabilities are different, and the processes and outcomes are distinct, so you can say that process is the, always the same, but the, the content is different. Now they seem to be much more intertwined as you could see from this example of this uh, generating this new type of iPad ad app for the magazine. So what we have done uh, is that in most industries, first of all, we are moving towards, which people in computing know pretty well, we are moving to this type of uh, 
stack architecture. So you have to think about the organization as a stack. Uh, so where you may have content and services, they may be embedded in physical products, and then you have certain way of transmitting data. Uh, you have the physical capabilities, and then you have some devices, uh, physical devices at the bottom. The point with uh, computing people know is that this stack is loosely coupled. So you can t replace here something without changing anything else into thing. This didn't work. This doesn't work in the uh, car or physical world at, in this way at all. It only works in the computing world because we can easily, because of the digital properties of digital, we can easily build new types of uh, gateways and it connect things in a very different way than in the, in the physical world. So what we have uh, are moving from is what people used to call the physical model architecture, what we call the layered model architecture. There are still modules, but the modules are now layered uh, on the stack structure. And organizations actually deploy and orchestrate these resources in a very different way because of their loose couplings between them. So this results in the fact that you have fluid product and boundary meanings, loose couplings between components because you have more and more standardized interfaces. You have heterogeneous layers following multiple design hierarchies. You don't have one design hierarchy as in cars. You have one tree, the whole car. Uh, you have product agnostic products or components. So these components may go to multiple different products. And you don't even know what, where you can use it. And you have a, a, a sort of loose coupling between these layers. Now you may say that, well, that, that's a, that maybe applies only for companies like newspapers, because the newspaper, which I provided the example, if you look at over time, they actually move to this type of stack structure. They were separating the content and the services, and they were also using different devices to distribute the content. And that was, uh, they had to change the business model. But we have done another study where we followed uh, automation platform. This is ABB. So ABB is one of, there are probably three major uh, automation, automation platforms in the world which compete. Siemens is one, Uni, I think Univac, uh, one of the General Electric or Univac is one, and ABB is three. These largely co dominate the automa process automation markets globally. And they, they started in 83, uh, where they basically moved to modular architecture. So they modularized the way in which the product automation system is organized. And then they moved to a uh, first time a generic software-based architecture, which is ADVANT. Uh, and then they uh, open that to others, so others can build on top of their architecture new types of capabilities. And now they are actually moving to the situation where they try to establish a uh, platform uh, market so that people can sell and uh, buy different types of components which can be added on top of their platform. And the, you can see that, that when, you, you move, when you move from here, this is a model architecture, and what they end here is largely an ecosystem and layered stacked architecture. And this happened similarly in, in, within the uh, 30 years. It wasn't easy, but that's what they sort of had to do given the technical capability. So, and this is, this is different than uh, newspapers because even here, everything is at the bottom, uh, fundamentally uh, connected to physical things. You, you measure certain things in a paper mill or, or, or a dairy or oil refinery or so forth. They are the real sensors which you have to actually control in these systems and you have to run them uh, in certain ways. So how do you design this new type of uh, configuration logic? What I would call the configuration logic. This is relatively tentative but we have been sort of playing around with this. The first one is that uh, if you look at the sort of uh, user side where the value is generated and the value is extracted, it, it's moving as a result of this digitalization, so that what we call the experience computing. So you have artifacts, places, actors, and times. These are generate certain data. Uh, uh, like uh, if you're carrying your mobile phone, that's an artifact. You are in a certain place, you do something. Uh, in a certain point, it can be recorded or it, it can do something. It generates certain type of... Uh, it's, it, it relies on embedded uh, computing assets, but it can be that, that trace can be given into certain things where they do, do data analytics. And that data analytics can be used then to build up algorithm-based services, like auto, automated uh, triggering of certain types of ads if, if you are in a certain place and you have been doing certain things in the past. Uh, and, and these can be over time added to uh, certain types of uh, ubiquitous computing assets. Largely, nearly all type of uh, computing uh, capabilities which more and more are used can be somehow modeled with this type of idea. 
because the value is more and more extracted from that. There are some examples of this. Uh, Rolls Royce, of course, it, it, used to, it still does cars, although they are, they are BMWs now. But it still makes uh, its own uh, engines for the uh, aircraft. And uh, uh, you may, may have heard this, but uh, Rolls Royce doesn't anymore sell engines. What it does, it, says, uh, it sells power by the hour. That these are these are the amount of hours we are actually providing uh, trust to your airplane in a way that uh, it, it is not. It's available. The trust is available, and they feel that because they have better computing capabilities and sensors and other things, they can actually provide much higher reliability and service in, in providing trusting services. This is an example of moving from product to service. Those who have been in the U.S. You may have seen this uh, advertisement with General Electric, which is another company, very similar company, 120 years old, started by Edison. Now it uh, runs ads in the U.S. which says that we are a digital company. We do digital stuff. We are a software company. Uh, and uh, the, the software company, uh, at the same time, tries to integrate all this stuff with, the, for example, things like, like gas turbines, which it does also uh, airplane engines and so forth. So something is happening. Uh, with regard to how people think about the value which is generated. Uh, so, and it's more and more viewed as a value co-creation process. So the users and the company provide shared assets which are used to co-create value and uh, add that value uh, later on to both sides. For example, uh, the idea that you provide trust by hour it requires that both sides accept the fact that uh, Rolls-Royce can collect data when the plane is running. It requires some types of contract to use part. The other part is that how do you uh, organize firm resources so that you can actually deliver this type of uh, change. And uh, here we have been thinking about in terms of structure, cognition, and identity. But th these are at the levels in which you have to start thinking about the actual layout, how you actually go about innovating. So uh, you, you may still have the value chain, but the, uh, at the end, you basically have digital stuff, which is signs and symbols. This, this is the, the, the baseline for value creation. And instead of thinking about in terms of value chain, you probably have to think about in terms of this configuration logic. So how do you actually organize the structure and the process in different ways? Or do you move to services? How do you actually think about them in terms of co different models of cognition? How do you interpret, and, and this is called affordances, how do you interpret the technology, what it can do in certain contexts, and how it uh, verifies or how it causes reorientation of your identity as a firm. And this is an ongoing dance. It's not something which you do for once. You have to do it all the time which make it very challenging and very hard to do. Um, and, and this tries to clarify it better. That's the reason why we, in the paper with uh, Anne Marshak and uh, Nati Shambisan, we called it the digital design space. It's basically a constant articulation of problem design pairs, which you have to work through uh, based on the type of things, which you, how you configure this. And you have two aspects which are uh, possible. The first one is, of course, that you make look, can look at new technological capabilities. You can expand those capabilities to reconfigure some parts of this value co-creation process. And when you do it, you have to also configure some other parts, possibly the, the structure and the cognition. Because uh, if you don't do that, you cannot actually deliver it. You cannot understand what you're doing. Another part of this that you can learn from this, like big data analytics and other ones, you can also pull new things and build it up. So, so digitalization is an ongoing process. Which sort of, it's a generative dance between these problem pairs. Let's look at the value system. Uh, generate new ways of sort of com combining together these types of moments where value can be generated and extracted, which cause new ways of configuring these capabilities, structures and uh, cognition and, uh, and so forth. This is very tentative, but we see, based on the, the way in which we have looked at it, it makes much more sense than the classical idea of value chains. Uh, one aspect of that is also, which you don't see in this figure, with, uh, and I wrote this other article, is who does that? Where's the agency? Who actually innovates? And that's, uh, uh, we, that's what we call the orchestration logic. Well, how do you orchestrate the actors who can actually participate and build up the innovation capability? 
And, I, and we wrote this article based on this idea, and this is just a tentative model, that you can think it in two different ways. What digital technologies basically enable you as an, as an actor? The first one is that uh, it can distribute the control who does what from centralized to distributed. And this is what you have seen, for example, software development is a well-known example from the firms used to run their project teams centrally. And now then came some people who started to do open source, which you cannot control anymore. People just come and do the stuff because the technical capabilities and possibilities are there. That's an example of moving from centralized to distributed forms of agency. The other aspect is um, uh, the other aspect is that, uh, which we also pointed out, that we used to think that uh, projects are largely homogeneous. You just find people who have very similar skills. So we do a payroll application. That's an easy thing. We, you need to a couple of people who know something about payroll and a couple of IT folks. But now if you look at the example of this iPad thing, you, you needed graphics designers, media designers, business model developers, all types of people which you had to be coordinated and thrown at some point into this innovation process. So we are moving more and more from homogeneous to heterogeneous forms of agency. So we need more and more multiple different types of people. Oops. Um, so, uh, so it moves that way. And that's why, why we have called that, uh, that you, you are moving more and more to the in, in, in environments which are like anarchies. These are networks which are emerge, spring up, dissolve, dissolve. And, and you start, somehow you have to orchestrate them. That's a sort of tendency where the innovation activity is called. So how do you control those? These are not similar types of things like tightly run projects where you have project plans and executions and other things. It's much more complicated environment. And uh, I'm not going to go through this, but we had this table, if you want to read and understand what, it, what actually happens, and what types of capabilities you have to build for each type of conditions, you can read the article. It, uh, and we try to especially provide ideas of these anarchy forms, what specific types of uh, capabilities you have to do, especially in relation to differences in the cognition, how you do, how you translate one type of cognitive model to another, which the other people have. If business model people have to talk with the media design people, how do you make that possible? All right. So um, to, uh, this is just to conclude where we currently are. Uh, the first and more important thing is that the most important uh, engine or factor which has influenced the innovation over the last 40 to 50 years is the emergence of digital technology and related infrastructures as a general purpose technology and it's a different type of general purpose technology because it separates the form and function and the content and the form. And these are the foundations for all the rest happens when the digital engine capability and cost goes up. And it, and it has influenced the scope and speed and scale of innovation. That's why everybody is talking about innovation, because you, it is, the potential is pretty much in every city. Uh, some people uh, call it in a way that, what can we do now when we can do pretty much everything? That's where we are currently. What should we do? Another aspect of that is that we see these cumulative effects, which is this idea of generativity. So innovations build upon earlier innovations. It's like a mud ball, which goes continuous moving on, it's, and which is a very different idea. If you look at the innovations in this car and the quality of the cars, you look at them in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, they, the car has significantly improved. Uh, and now it's pre pretty difficult to find really bad cars that was easy to find in 70s and 80s. So uh, the, the understanding how to produce a high quality car uh, has improved uh, significantly. But the, the basic functions and capabilities of the cars haven't really changed very much since the 50s. They're pretty much the same stuff is there. So most of the uh, quality differences is quality control changes and logistic and supply chain man management which have made car manufacturing much more efficient which have cut down the car cost and quality and increased the quality. Uh, but uh, you don't see similar effects of generativity as you can see in uh, uh, these type of uh, environments where you have digital assets. So uh, what we have seen also are new modes and logics of innovation which are emerging. New type of agency, new type of ways in which the boundaries of the innovation change. Uh, 
and the uh, uh, new context in which innovation emerges. Now the interesting thing is that uh, I think we are currently in this type of significant turbulent points. It's like a perfect storm, which is uh, currently happening probably uh, for the last 10, 15, maybe another 10, 15 years. We are probably witnessing something significantly important in the history of industrialization and humankind. Now the, uh, the question which people haven't really asked is that uh, will this fix it? Is there some sort of point in which the forms will again uh, become st uh, stagnated or they will become fixed and certain types of uh, forms you be, in a way exhaust the potential of the digital technologies. We are not there yet but um, how far we will move on until that, that, that potential is exhausted or if it's ever going to be exhausted. That's a sort of interesting question which um, we, we might theorize and, and think about. Uh, but it's an interesting uh, aspect which uh, we might consider and even discuss if there's more time to discuss after this. I'm pretty much done now, so that was my talk. I said I'm going to talk about one hour and 15 minutes. I pretty much kept it. I'm happy to entertain any questions or any tomatoes and whatever you want to do with me. All right. Thank you. Now, um, if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to uh, uh, have the microphone make rounds. I think it may be a good idea to speak to the microphone so that we can get everything stored. Okay, thank you. Uh, how do you uh, see the universities? role in this innovation pattern. I mean, I know in the Finnish universities, they more or less completely ignored it. Is there a, what's the role of universities in innovating? Or do they have any role in innovating? I think that they have. And of course, historically, they have. You look at many of the um, significant innovations which have also generated new forms of uh, digitizing services, they have, nearly all of them have started from universities. There may be two reasons for that, that they, the, the most uh, smart people who can do it, they probably go to university. The second one is that they may have an environment in which uh, it is easier to hone and advance it. Of, and the, as you know, many of these stories are also somewhat uh, serendipitous, like uh, like uh, uh, Prin and Bates who probably went to all search firms and tried to sell their, sell their algorithm and nobody wanted it. So they started their own company and the rest is history. Um, similarly, uh, pretty similar stories about Zuckerberg. That uh, nobody wanted this and he built it up by himself uh, with, with some help from the others. So, and I think that in this regard, uh, there's still a potential to do that. But it's probably, uh, now for everybody's of course hot in AI and uh, learning and other things. Um, there's going to be new types of uh, services and new types of innovations out of that. I don't know whether it's going to be of similar significance as platform innovations which Google and uh, um, Facebook are. But I think that uh, the role is still going to be important. So, so my, I understand this, but my question is really that uh, uh, the universities, they educate smart people, they do research so that you get good results, but after this, do they have any responsibility for actually getting these innovations into commercial market and kind of, should they fund behavior there or should that be left completely at, how would I say, the whims of private investors? Yes, uh, you are uh, probably, uh, as, as old as I am, I remember that there was this, uh, one cycle of uh, hot, that the innovations, uh, universities are hot and uh, you need to have all types of industrial parks. The first uh, cycle of that in Finland happened in the 90s and uh, if you look at now in the US, I guess it's, I don't know whether it's the same in the Finland, there's a similar wave now. Every, every university has to have their entrepreneurship center and their startup, uh, startup uh, jungle or whatever, uh, and everybody is sort of uh, emphasizing that. And of course it relates to um, the potential and, and capabilities of digital technology to m move to certain important fields which people have done before, especially Internet of Things, healthcare, and certain other ones where there's a significant innovation potential. And uh, some of, them, some of them succeed, some of them fail. Most of these fail. 
Uh, there's a lot of entrepreneurship studies, although I don't, uh, I'm not an expert in that, but most of these uh, initiatives typically fail. They don't really produce very much. It's just, um, so it's probably more than just that you have this park, you have to have a very specific type of uh, ecology uh, as a whole. Yes, I would like to ask about this, this is the divide also. This is one phenomenon that, uh, that has come along with digitalization. Yes. We have those who have access to computers, this is the technology, those who don't have. Is this a phenomenon that is going on? What is the future? Do you mean that uh, like digital divide? Yes, yes. Are we going to have a society that is even more in, inequal or are we having equality at the very end? So how do you see the development? Um, if you look at the cost of these things, uh, of course there are there's, uh, sort of enormous uh, ultimate uh, poverty uh, where um, you cannot really afford uh, computing technologies, but uh, the cost of the device, the devices themselves, just using them, is going to go down. Now, does that mean that, uh, uh, that these people can uh, lift themselves from poverty or uh, change the social uh, uh, class structure, if you put it that way, uh, is a much bigger question. Because if you, if you look at uh, generally uh, what, what, the, what the economic effects of this change has happened, uh, has happened is actually extreme income inequality, which has been growing all the time in all, uh, in all industrial societies. And you, probably in the extreme form you can see currently in the US. So these are seem to be totally separate things that in, uh, on the one hand uh, you have better access to information and uh, better capabilities for everybody, but the, the effects, the outcomes of that in, the, in, uh, in, the, in terms of economic dist uh, wealth distribution and others seem to be promoting more and more inequality. And, and, and I think that at some point of time, but I'm not, uh, the, uh, I think that in, in many ways we are very close to early parts of the 20th century, the, and the, the golden, uh, what they call the Gilded Age or the Golden Age in the U.S., where uh, they introduced certain uh, antitrust laws and other things to actually break down that sort of monopolies and uh, distribute uh, and also change the distribution of wealth. We may wind up in a very similar situation, but that's a, that's a very different talk than this one. Yes. Um, so. Could you help understand um, the difference, in your own opinion, about digital innovations and IT innovations? Uh, in the definition by Nambisan that you used, he, he referred to it as um, innovations that leverage digital technologies. But that also opens the question of what exactly uh, is the difference between what we refer to digital technologies and IT technologies? Well, uh, as, I, as I said uh, uh, in the start, uh, one thing which we have been struggling all the time is that the phenomenon is sort of, uh, sort of we are losing it, it's disappearing, it's so complicated, it's changing so fast. So we, we have to invent all the time new terms to try to understand what it is. And it's different than what it was before. Of course, uh, when it becomes different, it still re retains something from the previous one. The technical stuff, the foundation is exactly the same. But the context and the scale and, and the stuff which you can do on it because of the, of the uh, Neumann architects, new functions are added. This makes it uh, much harder to sort of uh, characterize in that way. And so that's the reason why we used this very general tech definition. In this, uh, because it, we have had to also write in a way that's meaningful for people who come from innovation literature. So they basically uh, don't care whether you are dealing with biopharma or IT. It's, it's, it's new stuff for them. And uh, one argument which we have tried to make is that if you really want to understand this phenomenon, you have to understand something about the unique features of the technology. And that's the reason why we have to talk about digital innovation in contrast to non-digital innovation. Because it has these unique aspects which call for new type of theory. I don't know whether I answered the question. Uh, we can still use, of course, the terms like IT and other ones in, in, in other contexts. I've used it in a very specific meaning, which is that as part of the discourse which relates to uh, talking, uh, trying to understand innovation in general. Right. During your talk, I received a strong association with various forms of emerging platform economies. Yes. 
Do you think that the, these platform economies will are consistent with your idea of development or, or not? Uh, well, well, another aspect uh, of, the, of this type of change is that it, it seems to, when you get into these um, platforms, uh, loosely coupled architecture, it seems to imply by itself, especially the two top layers, uh, they become separate from the lower la layers where you distribute it and divide it. They become naturally prone to platformization because others can start adding new stuff on what you are already offering. That's the sort of nature of the digital technology. And then you, when you get that, you nearly, by definition, nearly always get into this uh, sort of network effects that you have to get certain stuff more in order to have more users to use it. So and in order to get this positive cycle running. So another uh, interesting aspect, of course, of this uh, evolution is that to what extent and under what conditions this digitization uh, implies also platformization. But in, many, in most cases that has happened. And uh, uh, it has also resulted that a, 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 a separate outcome of that is, which was discussed before, is that it has also re resulted in this enormous wealth distribution in, in qualities. Because uh, the network effects largely, con uh, not fully, but largely uh, dictate uh, the, game, the rules of the game differently that the um, winner takes nearly everything. So Google dominates the search. Uh, Facebook dominates most parts of their social relations and so forth. It, it is just the nature of the game. That's the reason why General Electric is pull, uh, investing enormous amounts of money because they want to become the platform for Internet of Things. Uh, and there are others like ABP which tries to do the same, although they don't necessarily have exactly the same type of um, assets. But, uh, uh, or whether it comes from IBM or somebody else, nobody knows. All right, uh, sorry, I have a question about some particular type of innovation. So now it's going, this, there is going ongoing hype about blockchain technologies. What kind of opinion do you have about it? Well, that's a... Uh, I, I don't have any, uh, any clear opinion of it, uh, in the sense that... Uh, how do I put it? Uh, there are two ways of reading uh, blockchain. One of them is that uh, it may become like an important component um, for certain types of platforms, to, for carrying out certain type of trust generating and trust uh, um, enforcing operations. Uh, another interpretation which I've heard is that, and I don't know, there are other things, you cannot predict everything from the technology, is that uh, it, it is a, a significant uh, threat to certain types of platforms which we have been used to operate with. Examples are banks, credit card companies, and others with, which have basically have been trust creating uh, uh, brokers between lenders and the, uh, uh, those who borrow the money, or uh, buyers and merchants and uh, customers. Kind of yes, so they, it, because uh, you can distribute this, this central uh, trust uh, creating mechanisms now to, 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 to each agent because you make it transparent, the, the transactions. So th there's a lot of speculation whether that will happen or not. Uh, and as you know, it, it's not technology alone which will determine where it will go. It's also the, the, uh, that's the difference between, between digitizing and digitalization. That uh, it is also the moves by the different social actors, regulatory changes, and, and other aspects which will, are also going to influence the way in which these um, these technologies will become embedded. Um, if, I, if I think where uh, blockchain technology currently is, I think it's pretty much the sa same status where the internet was in around 1993-1994. So um, it's very hard to make predictions based on that. It may be also that it's, uh, although I don't think so, because there's so many powerful forces and so much money being thrown at it, that, uh, some, uh, that at this state, and, and the, it's working technology and it has been demonstrated to uh, operate, and there are clear cases where it has shown to operate effectively and provide um, uh, better solutions than previous technologies. So it, I don't think it's going to be a fad. But uh, how fast and, uh, in, in how it, it, uh, and in which forms, it's much harder to tell. It's very hard. So.
Well, I too have a question. Yes. I mean, the, um, the designer and innovator in me is really thrilled about the possibilities of digitalization. But the businessman and uh, business school educator is a bit worried. I mean, if you take the, um, the value chain, the, the benefit of, of drawing value chains is that they sort of um, help us picture not only the value added or the steps where the value is added, but where value is created, but also where value is captured because value capture equaled value creation in the past. Not anymore. No, exactly. So my question is, what does digitalization have for us in terms of value capture? What's, what's going to happen to value capture? I mean, if we think about what used to be um, encyclopedia business has now become a charity rather than business. Is that what we are going to see increasingly in the future? Well, uh, if, if they are prone to these types of effects, yes. But you, you, you started to look at sort of new, uh, uh, encyclopedias uh, around 2000 and you look at the digital capabilities. Um, I would have buried that, well, uh, Britannica encyclopedia, it will di disappear because of the sort of economics and other things and just the cr power of the crowds. But of course, not all types of activities are not like that. Um, but there are a few uh, points which we can make in relation to that. One of my colleagues always says that, uh, you know, there's in the US there's C-suite, CX, like CIO and CFO and CMO and so forth. All these, these oper uh, functional leaders, like for IT or marketing or um, uh, uh, manufacturing and so forth. And uh, if you look at this idea of the structure, the identity and cognition. It basically means that, uh, and the way in which these, these different silos are being broken down by, by how you have to integrate all types of heterogeneous knowledge, C suite is pretty much over. Uh, the chief marketing officers nowadays are more and more, for example, because of big data and other things, they are more and more like IS guys. And IS guys have to be more and more like uh, marketing guys or some other guys. Uh, if they are in, the, in those roles. There's, the, of course, separately these parties who run the infrastructure, but the, the sort of value creation part is becoming a, a separate aspect of that, how you run the business. And I think that uh, business schools are in trouble in the sense that uh, the old models of thinking about business and, and drawing these value chain models and thinking about strategy, these are all up for grabs now. And that's a big challenge. And that's the reason I use Tashman, because uh, this Tashman comes uh, from Harvard, and he's probably one of the most uh, well-known strategy professors in the world currently, and consulted all the leading major companies in the, in the Fortune 500 companies and strategy. And, and if you even go look at Porter, Porter wrote an uh, article in Harvard Business Review in 2014 where he tried to make sense of digital phenomena. I don't think that he succeeded, but it's, it, it's an indicative that he has recognized that something has changed. Thank you. Um, do you have any further questions for Kalle? Okay. Okay, thank you for very nice presentations and ideas. And probably my question is a little bit beyond the, the presentation, but I'm a little bit curious person, so I like to ask this question. How you see that this digitalization effects on the representative democracy in general? Oh, <laughs> not, not, not a sort of small question. Uh, I think that there are, there are two stories to this. Um, and of course the first story has always been because um, it, uh, digital technologies has enabled new type of pu uh, public sphere. 
in the sense that everybody, you know, there's this positive story about it, that everybody can now publish their opinion, they can argue, and people will be much more informed. Um, uh, and there will, be, there will be much more possibility for uh, um, public debate, due diligence, all these types of stuff. That's a sort of positive story. And there's a lot of uh, uh, political scientists and also uh, people in the different uh, social movements which have emphasized these types of aspects. And there are examples where people said that this was the case, although I, I think that these are largely overemphasized, like the Arabic Spring, the role of the social media in sort of starting the, these types of aspects and uh, sort of building the argument. Although I don't think it was that important because I understand that, that, that uh, for example, in Egypt about 3% or 4% had phones in which you could participate in uh, Facebook. So it was largely the elite, uh, intellectual elite, which was doing it. That's a sort of positive story. But if you look at what's actually happening, probably the US uh, last uh, uh, election is the, the worst example of it, is that we, we see this enormous, uh, what, what I would call cyber balkanization. But people are more and more just talking with one another to, to confirm and to uh, reassure their existing opinions. And these opinions are becoming more and more polarized. And, and you see sort of both tendencies at the same time. So, uh, and I don't know what the clearance is going to be, but I, I see much more the latter currently than the former, which is the, which I, I see, um, uh, how do I put it? It's dangerous. It's just, uh, it's frightening, to be honest. Uh, so it's very hard to say what, what's going to happen. As you, as you know, uh, the, the current idea of democracy and the idea of public sphere emerged in the 19th century. Uh, and with it came, for example, the, the uh, public newspapers, the idea of responsibility, uh, but also the control, that there was certain control of certain content which was distributed. Um, now all that is gone, but we see much more polarized form than in the, those forms. So it's very difficult to say what is the appropriate uh, means whereby the democratic processes can be supported especially on the national scale. I think that locally, that's a different story. There's much more probably help and potential how to deal with the sort of local communities and things like that. But, but national, uh, global, very hard, very hard. Well, um, thank you again, Kalle, for your very interesting presentation for all the insight and following lively discussion. Uh, now, I don't know if uh, this goes to video or if I even should be doing this, but I want to remind all of you that today's entertainment was produced for you by Dux. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.